1968 and 1969. Uh, what branch of service? I served uh, with the United States Marine Corps. Uh, what general locations? All in the uh, I Corps uh, area of the country. That's northern South Vietnam, just below the DMZ. They called it the uh, the DMZ War in the Jungle Mountains, <clears throat> just below the DMZ. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted out of uh, college. Uh, I finished uh, college, uh, finished my bachelor's degree at Niagara University and continued on to get my master's degree in education. And then I, uh, uh, all my buddies were over there serving and stepping up, so I decided to uh, uh, enlist. And I thought training in the, the training would be best in the Marine Corps, so I, I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, do you remember recall the date? Yes, I joined the Marine Corps in uh, November 1967, uh, the Officer Candidate School uh, Hotel Company. We graduated in August of 1968 from uh, the OCS uh, Basic School. Uh, why did you join? We joined. I joined because uh, uh, I had buddies over there that I graduated from college with. We had an ROTC program. And uh, I didn't complete the four years. I just completed two years of mandatory ROTC. I didn't continue. But my buddies were over there. When I was going to graduate school there at Niagara, uh, I had some friends over there in the Army that were uh, serving and communicating with them. Uh, additionally, uh, additionally, I uh, I felt the patriotic surge. Uh, you know, everybody steps up during a time of war. Uh, the commander in chief decides to go. At that time, also, we had a treaty with South, Southeast Asia. It was called CETO, S E A T O, Southeastern Asia Treaty Organization. So, and, and uh, the basis of that treaty was if, if someone was invaded, that the other members of the treaty would come to their assistance. So, I thought that was an honorable thing to, to honor our commitment through that treaty. Um, that pretty much answers the question, yeah. What did you know about Vietnam before you enlisted? Oh, uh, absolutely nothing except for the year prior while going to graduate school, uh, receiving communications from uh, a lot of buddies there at Niagara University. They were in the Army. Um, and due to that correspondence uh, and the heating up of the war, uh, during that time period, 1967, um, that gave me more, that brought me more knowledge of what was going on over there. How did they describe it to you? Uh, well, it seemed like a, seemed like they were totally committed at that point. They were in various areas of South Vietnam, mostly uh, uh, I, uh, number one core, two core, three core in that area. And it seems like things were heating up, and uh, uh, the the troop level was was being increased month to month. And uh, it seems like we were out to win a to win a war and get it over with quickly. So um, that's what they talked about: just the necessity to uh, get it done, get it over with, and get back home. And what were your first days in the Marine Corps like? Uh, with training. Yeah. Yeah, training was, uh, well, OCS, Officer Candidate School, that was three months. That started in uh, November of 1967, and it was, uh, well, boot camp, a lot of psychological, a lot of physical training. Then we went on to, uh, we got our second lieutenant bars, our brown bars or butter bars, and at that point uh, we went into the, the basic school, which is a six-month-long infantry training course. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty rugged, but uh, pretty much covered everything technically that we needed to to know uh, prior to going to Vietnam. It was a lot of map reading, land navigation. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, I ended up pretty good at uh, map reading, and then I decided to uh, they they allowed us to select uh, all of all Marines, all Marine officers are initially trained to be infantry officers. Uh, but we could select our MOS's military occupational specialties, so I selected armor. So I finished basic school and I went to uh, 
I did go to our uh, tank school in Camp Pendleton, California for six weeks. So I graduated, graduated there as, uh, in um, September of 1968 as a tank officer, 1802 tank officer. Uh, what type of tanks? Uh, M48A3, that was a 90 millimeter tube. And uh, I had, so I had five tanks over there. Uh, I got a surprise when we first got over there. There was five of us in tanks. I uh, had just finished training and went over at the same time in uh, early, well, late December, late uh, September 1968. We got over there and they needed uh, infantry officers. So uh, the lieutenant colonel there assigned us all to uh, to go three months temporary active duty to infantry battalions. So we kind of got a surprise. Uh, we thought we'd go into something a little safer. Our chosen MOS uh, armor, tanks, a little more protection there. But but uh, so I served uh, my first three months in infantry, the second battalion, fourth Marines, third uh, Marine Division. And then my last nine months with um, with uh, Bravo Company, 3rd Tank Battalion, 3rd Marine Division. Same area, you know, from the uh, the DMZ area there. The South China Sea at 10 miles to the mountains, that was about 10 miles. And then there was 30 more miles to Laos. And just above us was the uh, DMZ. So it was a total of 40 miles. But the tanks could operate in the first 10 mile area with rolling hills, flat terrain. So now the, the training, um, you know, basic recruit training and and especially officer candidate school is very rugged. How did you, how did you get through all that? Uh, well, I got in pretty good shape before I for, before I went. Uh, and most most guys did, I think. Uh, I used to carry my sister that's in the other room there up and down a mountain, a ski mountain, on my back, a fireman's carry. So I, I got pretty good pretty good shape. So. They had, a, as far as the physical uh, challenge, yeah, they had a pl place, they had a um, an old course, which was a physical training course. And uh, I, I did pretty well with that right from the beginning. Um, so to answer your question, I think, you know, I guess pretty much prepared physically, psychologically. I was ready for, uh, to be yelled at by drill instructors. And I knew, uh, I knew what was coming. So I just got through the three months. Wow. Were you trained? Did you train on the M14 or the M16? M14. Okay. Yeah. When did you first see the M16, or did you? Uh, Vietnam saw the M16, and it was a terrible rifle, jammed all the time. And I think I got a file about that thick on uh, the M16 and uh, the problems they had with it over there. I mean, I certainly had problems myself with the M16, but at various times over there. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, people rotating, uh, enlisted and uh, high-ranking enlisted and other officers. Uh, I carried a 12-gauge shotgun for maybe a month and a half I, with a satchel of 12-gauge uh, uh, you know, buckshot. Then I carried an N79 grenade launcher with a satchel of maybe 60 to 80 uh, 20-millimeter rounds. Uh, they're essentially grenades, uh, M79 blooper, they called it. And that was like firing a grenade. And then uh, anything but the M16. I mean, the M16's jamming. You couldn't keep it clean. We couldn't see, keep ourselves clean. But the M16 was even, even though you tried to clean it at 2 o'clock in the morning, I mean, it was full of dirt. And uh, you'd do the best job you could, but you couldn't rely on it. Plus, it had inherent disadvantages that Colt manufacturing came out with finally and they agreed that there was some. So they made uh, additional, uh, they revamped that whole thing. And but unfortunately it was after I left. But uh, Now when did you uh, first arrive in Vietnam? Arrived uh, September 28th of 1968. Flew into Nen Da Nang and then went to Quang Tri and got my uh, was issued my rifle and my uh, everything else I would need, my pack, uh, grenades, the whole thing, you know. 
and then I took a chopper out to uh, Vandegrift, which is the center of I Corps, a uh, fire support base uh, Vandegrift, or they call it LZ Stud. LZ what? Stud, S T U D. They're right in the center of the country. There was big ridges on each side, and valley in the front, valley in the back, but it was just below the DMZ, 10 miles below the DMZ. And uh, flew into that, spent the night, one night there, and got friendly incoming fire. <laughs> Friendly, a uh, misfire, maybe 10 rounds, and tore our tent apart. Headed up in the trench all night. That was the first night in the country. Lost one pair of glasses. You know, I had two pair of hard lens right. glasses. Lost one pair in that trench that night. I was just down to my skivvies, but I learned that never to go to bed without being fully, have everything on, you know. And as a result, uh, from that point on, I always went to bed with my boots on. And fully dressed, M16 on your chest. Yeah. Um, from there, I flew out to meet my uh, platoon. It was out in Quezon. That was six months after the big siege out there, Quezon siege, right. January to March '68. So I flew out there and uh, picked up my uh, platoon. Now, what did Quezon look like after the siege? Uh, it looked. Uh, Totally barren. I mean, there was, it was just heavily jungled, a lot of mountains, you know, ranging from 400 feet to 2,000 feet, but uh, heavily jungled and, uh, you know, four miles from Laos. And I mean, you could see Laos, and, uh, but it was tame. We didn't have any contact. In fact, my first two months over there, I had no contact with the enemy. What was your first contact with the enemy? Well, that was in December of 68. That's after Johnson halted the bombing, November 1st of 68. And that's when we started to uh, have contact. They started coming back over the DMZ again and filtrating through the DMZ instead of going along through Laos, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And uh, so the bombing campaign was working. I mean, two months, a little platoon like mine, sometimes I was down to 34 men, I'm supposed to have 48 medevacs, uh, dysentery, uh, immersion foot, uh, rat bites, everything. So you lose part of your platoon through medevacs, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. But I mean, I, I was untouched. Uh, just a platoon roaming around 10 checkpoints a day, coordinates, um, and never got touched for two months. How long were those, um, you know, those trips? You said 10 checkpoints. Three weeks at a time. Yeah. How yeah. much ground, how much distance would you cover? Uh, Ten checkpoints a day. Well, uh, that was early morning till the evening before dark. You had to get to high ground, you know, try to get to high ground. So uh, distance, uh, I don't know, the jungle, you know, you're, you're using a machete. The point guy is using a machete. The map reader is number two. I was usually number six. Uh, so you're walking in a line, you know. I was using number six pack with my map, making sure the second guy was reading his map properly. But uh, to answer your question, um, I don't know, t two miles or something like that, maybe. But it was mostly jungle, it wasn't highland, it was kind of... Well, you know, you have Route 1 going up to uh, the DMZ and Route 9 going west to Laos. So mostly around on Route 9 going to Laos. All that whole route in the areas just below that and above it, mainly above it, like 10 miles up to the DMZ. It's all just mountains and jungle. That was Quezon, you know, it was Hill 881 south and north. Those were big battles there. But I was up there and never got touched. We knew we could, I did a lot of harassing and interdicting fires at night from all those fire bases, uh, four or five of them. I would call in a fire mission just for H&I, and I and I would keep them. I mean, if there, you knew there was an enemy in, the, in Laos, you could see the smoke and stuff. There's supposed to be 40,000 enemy troops, but uh, uh, I think they saw that H&I fire coming around our position that night, and I brought it in pretty close, within 100 meters. And then you could just add on to that, you know, a 25. So you'd... If you ever, if you got hit, that's the reason we were able to sleep at night because uh, I would just call in. Uh, I'd say 
the words would be uh, my fire mission, uh, fire on my last coordinates, or fire on my last. And then uh, you could always add to that, and then you'd tell them to, well, you'd have arranged that beforehand, make sure you give all those coordinates to the, on my fire mission to other fire bases in the area. Uh, fire support base Russell, uh, uh, Alpine, uh, Argonne, and uh, Neville, fire support base Neville. So they're all mountaintops with 6105 you know, millimeter howitzers. So they there's inner locking fire. I mean, plus I could get jets in 10 minutes, A4 Skyhawk and Phantoms. So we were never really afraid. We we had a, a lot of support, you know. What could you do anyways even if you were afraid? You know? it, was it just your platoon going out or was it, were you going out with other platoons? And... No, just mine. I mean, there was others operating in that area. I, I knew that. But you always, you always had your AO, they call it, or TAOR, Tactical Area Responsibility. And you, no one else was supposed to operate in that area. So one time I saw 10 from like Hill 80, 81 South. I could see 10 of them, 10 people running into Laos. Uh, I mean, I could have called a fire mission in on them, but I didn't. Uh, I suspected they were the enemy. Yeah. How accurate were the maps? Oh, very accurate, yeah. Well, I was confident enough to, in fact, I got maps and I got some of my, I mean, I got my checkpoint coordinates that I've had. I mean, I took them home with me. But the maps were, uh, I never really thought about that. You just have confidence. I mean, to bring in fire missions every night to, to uh, safeguard your position and just make sure they're on target. I started way back, I mean, 300 yards back with 82 millimeter motors. That's 4,000 meters. And then you bring it in. Their range is uh, 82 is 40, or about 4,000 meters. So then you keep bringing it in tighter to you. And then you can put it around in a circle. Uh, but you just, I was very conservative. You just start at 82. Then you tell them to switch to 105s. And then you get it in, you know, just keep adding 25, 50 yards. And just decide that's where you want it. Now, would you find any evidence of the enemy being nearby or oh, yeah. killed by that? Yeah, a lot of, uh, we find a lot of stuff, uh, caches, they call them, and rounds. Not not big ones, though. I think they did a lot of that the year before, 1967. They had some really big battles there. Yeah. In 19, early 68. I mean, they had uh, Quezon and Tet and then Dido in May of 68. I mean, those were big battles. and. Didn't have to go through those big battles. Now, what when you had contact was it mostly was it was an NVA or Viet Cong or N NVA, yeah. yeah, yeah, and sometimes Chinese. Yeah. Uh, what was your assessment of their capability, their, uh, their uh, military proficiency? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, our the way we operated. I mean, the tactical strategy, I mean, going through the jungle with a machete, tell them, I mean, that's the way we operate. It was all body count under General uh, I mean, Westmoreland, you know, he, he was interested in that. So the strategy we was just go on small units like ours, just head for the enemy, search them out, close with them, and try to destroy them, search and destroy, sweep patrols. And... Uh, I don't know, it doesn't take, I mean, the enemy, they were supposed to be very good, I mean, but when I encountered them, uh, they, uh, I mean, you walked right into those ambushes. I mean, they could see you coming, they let you get in, they wounded a few, and that was their strategy. I mean, there's not a lot of, so then if they wounded a few, then, you know, you can't call an air artillery on your own wounded people. Right. So they knew that, so they didn't have to be that good, I don't think. That was a bad strategy, though, on the part of that search and destroy stuff, uh, because everything I learned in basic school as far as tactics and discipline, you know, fire discipline and silence, wow, they knew we were coming. That machete, you know, all the noise. Yeah. Um, how did you maintain morale? I mean, you're, you're a unit leader. How did you maintain morale in, in that type of situation where you're taking casualties and yeah. you know, going through very tough terrain. 
Oh, it was difficult. It was, uh, well, I don't know. I think I, I mean, you're all in the same boat. You work as a team and, uh, you know, you just try to use your common sense. There was a lot of tactics to getting hit or hitting them. You just, uh, when you saw them, you fired on them. When they saw you, they fired on you. Uh, all throughout the month of December, we were getting a lot of contact. But uh, how you kept them together is, uh, well, there's no frontline charges. I mean, there's not, you know, let's, I mean, char frontal assaults on the enemy. I think they respected me a lot from day one because I was out there. I took, uh, I mean, I checked lines every night uh, to two or three in the morning, use a starlight scope. I sat in the foxholes and, you know, with them and, you know, they, they knew, they had to stay awake. Uh, it was like two men to a hole, 30 meters apart. You know, mostly at 360 on the hills, sometimes down the flats with maybe three squad size ambushes. Mm -hmm. But I'd go over, I'd spend the, you know, you didn't get much sleep over there. There was a lot of sleep deprivation. So everybody in the same boat, they knew I was doing, you know, I had to go out there and wake up listening posts that are, were answering, you know. You call in sit, situation reports or sit reps. And um, then you have to go out and get them. That's 150 meters out from your lines. So I did all that. I think they respected me and I was out there and I had as my jungle route was as bad as theirs. Yeah. From rat bites and all that stuff. So what do you do when you find the listening posts asleep? I mean obviously you wake them up, but that's kind of a serious yeah, I only had it three times, but it is serious because the CO, I mean, I worked on a lot of company size operations too, and sometimes you get to a mountain. I mean, when we built those fire bases over there, Alpine, Russell, and Argonne, it's a matter of searching, you know, Hilo lifted in or overland assaults. I had 10 different uh, Hilo lift assaults, and then some overland, you know, where you travel overland to the objective, like the mountain. They want to put a fire base up, so you do sweep patrols, patrols all the time to secure it, make sure the whole mountain was secure and the base of it. And then they would bring in the uh, bulldozers and they'd fly them in on those sky cranes and ch uh, chinooks. And they'd dig the pits. They'd bring in bulldozers and stuff in the 105. And uh, so if you were up there at night uh, for the for like a week and a half or so on the lines, you try to clear fields of fire and then um, put the listening post out, one in front of each squad. So the CO would hear on your the radio, you know, and the listening port, well, listening post, like I would call in, you like LP1, LP1, this is, this is uh, Echo 3, uh, said rep over. And if they wouldn't answer, and then it'd go on, I'd keep trying, you know, every two minutes. If they weren't answering, then the CEO would get in line and said, Lieutenant Skeels, get out there and wake him up, you know. Right. Because I knew where they are, I'd put them out. How do you, I know that you put them out, but it's dark there. It's dark. Yeah. Dark. Well, a red lens flashlight. Okay. And I take the radio radio man with me and... Uh, I wonder what's going through your mind when you're going out to the listening post and doesn't respond. I mean, I, I mean, it could be that they're, you know, suppose they're dead and this is an ambush. I mean, how do you prepare for that? Yeah, I mean, you just do. I mean, you got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. And so it's me and the radio man. And you brace yourself. Uh, you just, uh, I knew the coordinates and about where they were. And you keep calling, you know, in a low voice, you know, key, key your handset, you know, if you can hear this. And um, if you're if you're awake, if you're in trouble, just keep the hand center. So most of the time, you just get up on them. It's just the human body. I mean, they fall asleep. Yeah. You can't yell at them. I think they respected that that I didn't rip them a new one. You know that that they. Uh... How did how did you how would you punish somebody? I, I mean, I'm thinking. Well, they're already in Vietnam. I mean, yeah, you can't. You can't. Uh, can't yell. I mean, everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's. I mean, I lost uh, forty pounds in two months. Oh. So they were doing the same thing, and 
I knew I'd only be out there three months. They were out there for like 364 days. And they, those enlisted guys, I mean, the guys that fight the wars are really lance corporals and the sergeants, you know, the squad leaders, sergeant uh, corporals, you know, squad leaders, uh, fire team leaders, your lance corporals, PFCs. They're the guys out there in the front lines, but they, uh, you know, I don't know what's going through their head, 364 days of that ordeal. I mean, infantry guys. Wow, they suffered. Because I suffered for three months. It took me three months to get rid of my jungle rot. I mean, the, the, the corpsman actually lances your your hands every night, squeezes out the pus, and then puts some stuff on it. But the next time you got to do the same thing again. But some guys had it right to the bone. You know, you could see their bones. Then you would get it on your hands then as well as your feet? To do what? The, the jungle rot would be in both places, hands and feet? Yeah. The jungle rot in terms of... Well, those, some of those guys, you know, they take their boots off at night or yeah. you can't... I never did, you know, and I always kept the uh, my pan legs inside of my boots so the leeches couldn't get in there, you know, because every time you get a leech bite, that's how you get infected. Yeah. And sometimes I'd have 30 leeches on me. One thing, problem. I mean, there's something unique, I think, about fighting in the jungle. I mean, you're you're fighting an enemy, but you're also fighting a jungle. Oh, you're fighting all that stuff that goes with it. I mean, just to stay alive. I mean, sometimes resupply wouldn't come for five days. I mean, the monsoon is a low ceiling on those mountains. The chopper pilots didn't want to come in. Um, but I mean, the sleep deprivation, because you're trying to stay alive, you know, you, and uh, immersion foot, I mean, my feet were always white because I wear my boots every night and you take them off during the day. If you get a sunny day or something, uh, take them off just to, just to let them have a little sunlight. But I mean, so you, you were dumb about it. You common sense, you tried to stay clean. But my teeth, when I got home, I had 27 cavities and I was, as a lieutenant, I was supposed to set the example. Yeah. Yeah. Now, while you're leading a team, uh, or even in that whole experience, is there anything that you can remember being funny or ironic or...? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, well, you know, just visiting the holes at night. Uh, we Sometimes we hold up at an abandoned fire base like Rock Pile. Mm -hmm. And we would, my platoon, we'd take over half the base because with a platoon, you can't take over a whole base. And uh, I mean, the rats were in those bunkers there. I mean, there. So I, I mean, I never slept. So I go back and just check the lines all night, make sure they're they're awake. But I guess you know, stopping on the in the holes and talking to them. I mean, lighthearted moments. You know, it was a lot, a lot of. But imagery, there wasn't no a lot of joking around. Uh, um, I did once uh, get the mail. The choppers were bringing out the mail. It was always like two weeks late, but. They drop, they drop it, you know, and we'd have to go find it in the jungle. And then you get to it, and I, I, uh, there was a letter from my mom, and she, she uh, said um, that she had won the high mom contest. In other words, she could get a free call to me, mm -hmm. and she was, you know, it's kind of like yelling through a written letter, you know, where the hell are you? How come, how come I can't reach you? How come you, how come you don't call me? I won the contest. Yeah. You know, here you are in the mountaintop and, and you know, your mother's still yelling at you. Yeah. So the, the troops get a kick out of that stuff. And the Dear John letters, you try to turn that back around and and make it a little lighthearted. Uh, but, you know, you stay, because you're going through, what you're going through is so rigorous that you just bring up, you bring it naturally, naturally bring up some lighthearted stuff. It just comes to you. Yeah. How did you let off steam when you were, you know, when you did go on R and R? Oh well, yeah, we let off. I met two uh, lieutenants on the flight to. Uh, I chose Sydney, Australia, because that was seven days, and uh, we just cut off our fatigues, and you could fit three beer cans in each pocket, so. Uh, so we, we stayed at the Coogee Beach Hotel, which is right on the Coogee Beach. 
So, as you know, there's uh, over there, I mean, there's topless, you know, so you know, we let off a lot of steam. And they, in fact, the Coogee Beach Hotel honored us. They, they said they took a tape of that evening, us, the three guys, we sat there, and all the drinks were free, and I think we danced, there was 500 people there, Australians. I think we danced with every girl in the place. And it ended around nine, 2 o'clock, and I couldn't even, I mean, get up from my table. I don't drink the heavy stuff. Either. Those days, you know, you drink double, triple shock, Jack Daniels. So, I mean, that was... Uh, well, we just had a lot of fun together. Uh, I, I'd like to do some research and find those guys today. Uh, that we spent seven days with an R and R, and we have to know each other like brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Are you in contact with anybody that you served with? Yeah, from my platoon, uh, four guys. I found them uh, starting in 19, 2000. The power of the internet, you know. Right. Right. St starting in uh, 2000, 2002, I think. So something like 40 years later, uh, I got interested, you know, I, I, I even joined a vet post in 2008. So it's kind of like you isolate yourself for many, many years, and then finally, uh, you know, after, it was, I guess it was triggered by 2011, 2001. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people were getting patriotic and they call them the gray beards, the Vietnam vets, and all of my Marine friends that I graduated from, high school, from uh, OCS with in uh, October 16, in October of, uh, no, excuse me, in August of 1967. Uh, they were having a reunion, and I found their, their website. So we had a big reunion, and 70 out of 160 showed up for the reunion. So. So I found found a whole bunch of them again, and that was an interesting three four days. And then uh, just through certain websites like lzrussell.org, it was in the VFW magazine. Uh, that was one of the biggest battles of the war. And it was LZ Russell R U S S E L L dot org, very great website. And uh, if there's anybody that was on that fire base could belong to it. I think there's 300 members. It's not really active anymore, but still you can get on it and the membership and all the guys there. And each guy got to write a story. If you at any time were up on LZ, LZ Russell, it was overrun on December, excuse me, February 25th, 1969. Mm -hmm. That was a month after I left uh, my unit. And uh, they got the hardest, my unit got hit the hardest up there. And a total of like 38 killed and 68 wounded. There was, there was a whole company up there, but they got hit real hard, condition red. Something like 300 sappers come up through, uh, and uh, they exposed, they made a, there was a gap in the lines. They took out one hole, satchel charge, and the 60 meters, and they just come up, and they were all over the, running hole over the top. Yeah. The lieutenant that replaced me, Lieutenant Hunt, he got killed, and he ran out of the bunker that I was, finally, that I kind of put started on. And uh, because I was there for two weeks, uh, I started on the bunker. Then he ran outside, he got stitched, and went back inside. And they threw a satchel charge inside. Lieutenant, uh, I forget his first name, Hunt, H U N T. And um, so that commemorates, the website commemorates that's firebase getting overrun in February 25th, 1969. And there's a lot of good stories in there. It's almost like reading a book, but you're reading it like, totally nonfiction. You're reading everybody's story and what they recollect, the listening posts out front of the lines, with the immediate lines, what they endured. Some of them pretended to, to be asleep or wounded or killed, just laid there in the jungle. And just the, the enemy coming up over the top of them. It's unbelievable to read some of those stories. So through those... Websites, uh, I, I subscribed to it. And as soon as I got on, three or four guys contacted me. said, hey, I think you were my lieutenant. I think you are my platoon commander. So uh, I'm, I, I've been emailing maybe at least twice a week, uh, three different guys. And then the guy that took the lieutenant Conley, 
and took the uh, platoon after the lieutenant. The, the lieutenant that replaced me, Lieutenant Hunt, got killed a month after I left my platoon to him. And I met him and I turned him over to my platoon. And then Conley took over him, so then he became the uh, third platoon commander. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm in contact with him too. And you haven't you haven't met yet though, right? No. No. Well, haven't agreed to uh, to meet. And fortunately, the LZ Russell group, the website's still on there, but it's not active. Um, but they used to have reunions, I guess, before I found out about the reunions every two years. And um, so if they continued to do that, it would certainly have gone. And right. met, I might do that someday, but there's a guy in Washington, there's a guy in Wisconsin, and there's a guy in Colorado. Uh, I think eventually we'll have a reunion. When you, when you finished up the three months, where did you, where did you go next? Then I went to uh, Third Tanks, uh, first platoon, Third Tanks. So I reported to uh, it's a little hill right outside of Camlo, where they have downhaw, and then up the road there at the intersection of Route Nine and Route One, a little village called Camlo, and right next to that was a little hill called I mean there are hills I mean 110 meters high called Vindai Vin V I N D A I, so that's where Bravo Company had their Third Tanks had their rear CP. They only had 30. Or 40 guys there at any one time and sometimes we, we hit a lot of mines my platoon hit 12 mines I hit two myself 35 pound mines and we'd, we'd walk them back there to get them fixed yeah what uh, the 35 pound mine do to a tank blow off uh, a section of road wheels maybe four yeah. they're 100 pounds a piece just blow them 100 yards and two or three sections of track but we always carried extra track and extra road wheels in our gypsy rack on the tank. What does that feel like inside the tank? Oh wow, it would, it would lift the tank off the ground maybe five inches. That's 48, 52 tons for a tank. And big black cloud. I mean, you thought you were done. I mean, now you yeah. black smoke. But I always had my helmet. I, my ears are fine. Yeah. But uh, you're worried about a follow-up sapper attack, so you got to you can't dwell on it too long, but it sure is a hell of a loud explosion. And if there's any infantry around you, there never was. We operated with the Arvins, but they operated way behind us. They didn't want to operate near the tanks. The, the, the Arvins were known to be 10% sympathizer, 50% known Viet Cong. So they knew uh, there was mines all over that area. Geo Lin, Kong Tien, Ocean View. All up that road to uh, Geo Lin, Kokian, the dirt road. I mean, I mean, it was it was embarrassing to hit mines because the CO had a CO named Captain Miller. It was just embarrassing to call him up on the radio and said, "We can't accomplish our mission. Two of my tanks have been mined. You can't abandon it. It takes two hours to button up the tank to limp it back to get fixed. So you can't accomplish your mission and." Uh, you can't abandon it because you got to provide security. Right. So you just do a 360 and make sure there's no other mines in the area. Um, and you would uh, wait the two hours and you'd call up so you can't complete. I mean, people would get upset with you, upper ranking officers, especially if you're on a reaction force and somebody's getting ambushed. Right. Wow. And you'd feel, I mean, I kept a diary all through my tanks. And uh, just daily activity, maybe a paragraph every day. But uh, did you have any direct action with the tank? Were you actually engaged the enemy? Or? You know, I really lucked out that uh, I got a lot of income and in almost three times a week. I mean, incoming motors from the DMZ. Yeah. They weren't supposed to fire at us, but 82 millimeter motors, their 60 millimeter motors they had, and some rockets. But we'd get them all the time and. I just put in my tanks in the 360 because I operated it from the South China Sea all the way along the DMZ. It's like a big ridge line. Right. And then you can see the Ben High River and the Sep the River. You can see their tanks down there and their flags. I don't know how many miles that would be. Uh, 
like five miles away or six miles, but you could see into there. And then, but I would operate along right to the mountains there. And that's where we'd hit a lot of mines and get a lot of incoming all the time. They call into the Paris Peace Talks and answer 11 questions. Then we were getting fire. I'd, I'd just, you'd estimate the coordinate. Right. And sometimes you get, you see the outgoing pop and the, uh, sometimes that, that entailed seeing the actual blasts, you know, the fire from the outgoing. Right. So I'd call back and ask permission to fire on that coordinate. And 99.9% of the time they'd say, no, you can't fire back at them. So you just do a 360 and wait it out and wait for the, you know, there's always a possible sapper attack to follow incoming. Say I had to button up the tank, just sit there at a 360 and wait. And then uh, they get back to you on what you can do. And uh, There's only one time that uh, they, they said, yeah, go ahead. If you can, you know, the coordinate, you can fire back at them. So I have three of my five tanks, uh, you know, fire at a certain coordinate. It's a range finder. So you could range out on that. 80% chance of a first round hit with a range finder. It's old technology, but yeah. so you can look at the coordinate and figure out the distance. You range it on the first round, then you follow that wherever it would hit. And then the second, then it's adjusted over the radical. Just it over. So second round was always 100. percent So I would fire. We would fire five or six rounds of high explosive HE at, at those coordinates and try to take it out before they can pack up. I mean, they would they would fire a few rounds and move out. But I had no direct contact uh, with the enemy. I took a lot of suspect D's. I'd round them up uh, maybe ten different times. I should, in hindsight, I should have looked more, searched more, like in the base. Some of those hills were getting pretty mountainous, and all of a sudden you see five or six black-dressed, uh, they suspect the Terror Viet Cong, so round them up and take them back to a place called Mylock. It was right near Cam Lo, M-A-I-L-O-C, and for interrogation. So it's just taking suspects back for interrogation. I think some lieutenants uh, used to just blow them away and they suspect. I mean, I, I know there was one that uh, actually searched the area. I mean, I used to work with a platoon of Arvins or squad of Arvins at least. I should have had them search the area for AK-47 or whatever, but I never did just round them up and uh, march them back, you know, to Mylock. What did you think? What was your assessment of the U.S. morale, you know, when you when you arrived in Vietnam versus when you left? Had you seen a change? Uh, you know, the morale when I got there is, um, unfortunately, you know, the morale is taken from each individual commanding officer. You know, like my platoon, I tried to instill morale. I mean, you're just fighting for you get. Point. You just fight for each other. Conditions were so bad, and then you're all, every day you were in fear of your life. I mean, you didn't think you'd make it the next day, but you just had to boost each other's morale. So you fought as a unit. But you never took. Uh, we used to take objectives uh, like in December of '68, heal uh, the assaults on a certain objective, and, uh, and we would take it, and then you just leave after three weeks. I mean, you never. If, you want, if they wanted to win the war, you'd go from objective to objective and just get it over with. So that, that hurt morale a lot. I mean, I had 18, I was only 22. I had my, my platoon was 18, 19 years old. They would say, what the hell are we doing out here? Or, or how come we're, I mean, they, they could, they understand there was nothing happening, you know, but they understood also that, you know, just by virtue of bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail, that things were happening there, and they thought we were winning the war. But Johnson halted it my second, uh, or the end of my first full month, the late October of 68, uh, we were called back to Vandergriff in showers, and they treated us like, you know, like royalty. We couldn't figure out what was going on. The whole battalion was back there. So. 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, that's 800 guys. 
So we couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, at the end of, I mean, we were fan firing our weapons. We were uh, cleaning them, uh, just reissued fresh grenades instead of our rusty grenades. The grenades were getting pretty rusty. There was M28s and M1 grenades. You just hang them right from here. What's the difference between... The baseball grenades, M31, were easier to throw like a baseball. Right. But they're both the same power. The 15 meter killing radius. And the other, but we filled our canteens. Like I'd always have them carry three canteens of water, four canteens of grenades, plus the grenades right here, like three here and two here. But they would get rusty after the rains and stuff. So we were we were outfitted with all brand new stuff at Vandegrift, and all of a sudden, it was like on the sixth day they said, "Okay, it's called off. Back to the back to your units and uh, back to the jungle." So we just headed back out of the jungle. But before we did, the, all of us lieutenants, there was four of us lieutenants, look at each other and say, what in the hell was going on? And couldn't figure out what was it. One of the guys said, well, they just found out that we were going we to gonna try to win the war. We were going to be the first battalion to hit the beach, Haiphong Harbor, which is right in the middle, of, well, right at the southern end of North Vietnam, but a very important area, Haiphong Harbor. And then we we're going to hit it and try to divide the country and just pound them into submission. Um, but all of a sudden, it was obvious that a week later, Johnson halted the bomb and so they decided, as well politically, to go with, uh, you know, the program, the counterinsurgency, the CAP program. Mm -hmm. You go to the villages and train the South Vietnamese to take over instead of trying to win the war. But I'm... I'm 100% positive, you know, it's, then you're looking back at that period of time. I didn't give it too much thought for 35 years, but I mean, those figures in my diary and stuff, I mean, you, you knew what was going on. You can put two and two together just by reading the history books now that, geez, uh, we decided not to win the war in November 1, 1968, when he started helping the Baldwin. Because right away, we started getting hit. They started coming back over the DMZ again. And uh, had a couple of ambushes involved with. And a lot of contact then. But it was obviously the, the enemy knew what was going on too, you know. They, they knew they weren't going to get bombed anymore going on the Ho Chi Minh. And How do you react to an ambush? What do you, what do, you do tactically? Well, you just you pull back and... Uh, you know, unfortunately, the support over there was terrible in many ways. Uh, like in tanks, we only had three-man crews instead of four. The M16s were terrible. I only had, uh, in my three months of infantry, I only had three radios, I was supposed to have four. One for each uh, squad, you know, plus one for myself, you know. But in an ambush, you know, uh, I remember, you know, you... You get hit, and then you're calling the squads. You know, finding out you want to you want to count. You know, you, you missing anybody, and somebody say, "Yeah, we're missing two. But I'd have to send a runner over to the squad, which would take minutes. I mean, crucial minutes. You know, to find out that the runner'd have to come back. So even though I asked for, you know, squad every every other day, I'd ask for a their radio, a PRC twenty five. So, uh, so yeah, you you find out who's missing, and then uh, because you wanna, like one time my my squad was ambushed. I was trying to locate them. I mean, I knew where they were, the coordinate, but I go down to uh, envelop the enemy, and then you locate them. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have enough smoke grenades, so uh, I couldn't find the uh, exact area where the point of my squad that was ambush and they took five wounded so I kept moving in until there were snipers all over the place you know I think they were Chinese uh, but then you get hit you, you pull back because your objective is to uh, if, if there's anybody missing or wounded get them then pull back and then just come in with your artillery uh, as hard as you can there's an old joke you know that uh the Marines, you know, go on the offensive, but tough guys, you know, and they locate the enemy, then they destroy. 
where the army is a little smarter, they go in and close with the enemy, then they pull back, use artillery, then they go in and right. close. But uh, in those days, in Vietnam, you, we were on the offensive all the time, so we had to locate the enemy. And unfortunately, they were smart. It zigzag bunkers sometimes. Uh, I got pictures of bunkers. Uh, um, zigzag bunkers, so they let you get, like a mountain, those fingers coming off the mountains. So you, you got to search out those fingers too, and so it's thick stuff. So you get in the middle and you're looking, and all of a sudden you start to see bunkers, you know, zigzag, one there, one over here, one there. They let you get in the middle and they open up. So I mean, that, and that happened to unit after unit over there. I mean, that was really, the tactics were bad. Because what can you do? They they shot the wound and you can't call an artillery and you're wounded. When you said you had um, missing, and do you ever, you know, get a scenario of somebody's missing, you just never find them? No, we found them. Uh, you know, it just it's, it's an all day thing. You know, of that's why the battle goes on and the weariness. You know, and you got air support. I mean, they want to know where to drop the stuff. And before I had a before Skahawk, I had uh, artillery. You know, just waiting. I had a Bronco guy up there. They started using the Obi-10 Broncos mm -hmm. in, in that this November of 68. And they uh, try to locate, you know, missing for me and stuff. I mean, it was, it was a terrible situation. And, uh, but no, you, you eventually, the darkness and come and you recover. But, you know, you take a lot of wounded uh, doing so. It's mm -hmm. unfortunate. You know. Witness any atrocities over there? No, I didn't. Uh, it was all body count over there, and they sometimes I guess they wanted uh, their. I mean, kill ratios. You know, they wanted uh, evidence. You know, and that's why. At some time, I heard they're over there that they were cutting off uh, ears to make to show evidence of body count. Uh, I had an ambush once on the enemy. It was a Y-shaped ambush, and it was at night. And uh, yeah, we let you know there's was seven of them getting the kills on them. But uh, no, we. Uh, I mean, I watched my troops. We we put them on bamboo pole, bamboo poles and. Uh, no. Didn't see any atrocity. No. So you spent your three months uh, leading infantry group, then you let the tanks come home. Is that the last assignment you had in Vietnam? Or was there yeah, tanks. Yeah. So what was it like uh, when you got, you just had to serve a year in Vietnam? That's all. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it must have felt like a lot longer. Yeah, it felt like a, wow. That's why my empathy towards the enlisted, uh, serving that many days out there uh, and just being rotated back via chopper, you know, yeah. back to safety, and then finally getting out. Those infantry guys, wow, praise be to them, you know. So what were your feelings leaving Vietnam? Oh, I had, uh, I had good feelings leaving, uh, you know, a lot of the time, I mean, you're just grateful of going back to, they say, the world. I mean, getting out of there, it's your turn to rotate. After a year, you did your time. And I I got my fitness reports a couple of years, three years ago. And you can ask for them, you know, your decorations, your fitness reports I wrote in. I took, took two years to get them back, but how surprising I had all good fitness reports. You know, sometimes you think to yourself, well, maybe, maybe one or two is going to be bad, you know. Because in infantry, I had five different COs. I mean, you never got to know anybody, really. I mean, you imagine that, five different COs. You know, a lot of times you were attached to other units, reinforcing other mm -hmm. battalions. Or, and uh, so you, you say, how am I going to get a fitness report if nobody really knows you? But, you know, somebody ended up writing, writing you up and doing a fitness report. And, a lot of unfortunate. It was just rotations were bad. Even in, 
even amongst the enlisted, you know, you'd finally teach somebody how to map read. So you didn't have to walk point all the time. I mean, I walked point a lot. Uh, and then all of a sudden he'd have to rotate and you got to teach somebody else. And you got to really, you got to, you teach them out in the field while you're out there. And you, you got to get do your checkpoints and you got to get to, uh, at night you got to get to, you got to know where you're going and you can't make mistakes. So the rotation is really hurt. I mean, there's always people, I mean, you get to know, you know, you're doing real well. That's part of the thing that I guess you get attached to them. Uh, you sit in the holes and talk and you get attached, but there's, you never really get to know anybody really well because uh, the rotations, uh, it seemed like, you know, uh, I remember 14 out of my 48 platoon member names. I never really had more than 42 guys full complement for me. It was 42. I was down to 35 at different times, but you never really got to uh, too attached only because because of those rotations. Yeah, it's hard to build a unit cohesiveness, I would think. Yeah. People are coming in and out all the time. But in tanks, I've had two tank reunions, and uh, there's 400 guys that belong to the U.S. Marine Corps uh, Vietnam Tankers Association. It's USMC uh, VTA dot org. And uh, they have reunions every two years. So, yeah, those guys are a good, really good camaraderie. Um, only because, uh, well, there's rotations there too, but uh, I found uh, three of my guys in my tank platoon. And that's uh, a lot of good stories there. But, I bet. yeah. So, how did you get out of Vietnam? Um, I was part of the first pullout uh, in August of 1969, so I took a whole company out of there. I think it was Charlie Company, uh, Third Tanks, and uh, everybody that was almost due to rotate. So we met at the Quaviat River. I was choppered over there, so we took them over and got them ready for embark, they call it. So then took the whole company to uh, Okinawa. And we got to Okinawa, went right to uh, Camp Hansen. You flew, you flew to Okinawa? No, uh, took a LST. Oh, okay. In fact, it was the LST whose name was Litchfield. It was a landing ship transport, yeah. landing uh, LST. Mm -hmm. So it took us five days to get to Okinawa. Once you got there, we just put 17 tanks on the main road and just took them into Camp Hansen. But that was... Uh, that was a good feeling. I mean, just keep, I mean, getting out of there, and that was my last assignment: is take that full, take that full company, yeah. get them ready for embark, then the actual embark, and then keep them busy while they were on embark. And everybody's going home. When people are going home, everybody's in a good mood. <laughs> oh, what did yeah. you did you fly? Then you flew from Okinawa to the continental United States. Yeah, then I spent a week in uh, Okinawa at Camp Hansen, and then I flew back to Travis. He got a really icy reception at that point. Tell me about that. Had to change uniforms uh, right there at Travis. I mean, just the, the public the stairs and stuff. And, uh, you know, coming back to Vietnam, I mean, all that stuff in combat, it, it doesn't hit you for a long while. But you know you've been through something uh, terrible. And at the same time, you're so glad, gratified to be home. And I had my college buddies calling me and, they want to get together and uh, start our life like in Manhattan Beach, California. So it was three guys and one guy from my last uh, year in the Marine Corps. I spent at El Toro Marine Base, El Toro, California, mm -hmm. right near Newport Beach, which is a great place. I've been there. Yeah, I've been El Toro. So I was supposed to go to Fifth Tanks in Pendleton, yeah. but at the last minute I called and said, uh, you got anything else, anything else open so I can make a quick, quick decision? The lieutenant colonel said there's a bill that opened also at uh, El Toro. So he said, you want to take it? You got to make your mind real quick. So he said, yes. So I said, where is it? And they said, near Newport Beach, California. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm there. So I spent the last year there. And one well, of the lieutenants I made move up to with my college roommates. So as far as dwelling on wartime effects 
and it just seemed you pushed back on it, it seemed to go away and parties and girls and things and yeah, you had your moments of being down, but uh, flashbacks, images. But it was also, uh, boy, you, you get right into that, the business of living again. In that, that icy reception, that, that lasted for a while. I went home, nobody really asked any questions. My brothers and stuff, you know, it was, it was just a, an ugly war. It got ugly at the end, and the public's... Uh, um, well, it was, I think it was all media created, but it was the public's re reception of the uh, Vietnam vet. It wasn't, wasn't very good at all. It was terrible. Uh, I think all, all of a sudden, Afghanistan, Iraq, it's come around, and we finally get, we finally got a lot of respect from the World War II vets and uh, the general public. Yeah, they, they say thank you for your service. And, but before, it was like, you know, Vietnam wasn't really a war. It was right. a couple of bad events over there, and you took part in it. And how could you do that? And the reasons that you went over there weren't that good enough. And in the years, in the years following, did you, you know, feel any of those symptoms of like PTSD? Or oh yeah. PTSD? Oh yeah. Well, PTSD. I don't know what you would call it. Uh, just images and flashbacks. You know that you start to feel. Uh, you know, there's a, like I was beginning to tell you, there's attachment because of people rotating. You never really get to know, but there's also, uh, you know, flashbacks of you never forget. I mean, wow. Would you ever read any episodes of feeling really hyper vigilant? I guess I do. I scan real well. I mean, like my daughter comes home different times of the night or something and. I'll hear the car coming in the driveway. You just hear little noises. My wife say, "How the?" She said it a million times. I mean, we've been here for seventeen years. She said, "How the heck do you hear that?" Uh, like in deer hunting too. I go up the Adirondacks deer hunting, and wow! I mean, I can I hear things that you know you're always scanning. I mean, I, I think that that helped me in my infantry as being a deer hunter when I was I grew up in the Adirondack Mountains, sort of like New York. Uh, you know, being out there and being stealthy and using a map and working through the woods. And But today I use, I go up there deer hunting, I use a GPS, a backtracking device, a compass and a map. And I go out by myself and, uh, you know, you can go way back in, you know, and you're confident you can get, you know, back out to your kayak. But I'm always scanning and listening for stuff. And so I think Vietnam will do that to you. I mean, wow. I mean, those patrols were unbelievable. Patrolling and those, I mean, that whole thing was, yeah. So, yeah, there's images you never get out of your mind and flashbacks. And uh, the guys that didn't make it, you feel bad. You know, the young kids, uh, they never got to, I mean, I lived a full life, you know. Yeah. I mean, you, have you made it to the Vietnam uh, Memorial? Yeah, we just went down there and read names. Yeah. Um, uh, Veterans Day. So, there was 10 of us from my post. Went down and each of us read 25 names from the wall you know, at night. I mean, ours were right around eight, eight, between eight and nine. So you were led to the platform and there's bright lights. And then you, we all turned around, saluted the, the wall and then read our names, you know. But there was bleachers out there and people, maybe family members sitting out there. And that was a good thing. Did it feel cathartic in a way? Yeah. yeah. Now what what became you after post military? What 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 was your career family like? I uh, immediately uh, my first job was uh, in a uh, little medical sales, and I had a couple of roommates, uh, college friends uh, in Manhattan Beach, California. When we first started out that got into medical sales, so I did too. We all kind of the same thing, but uh, I stayed in that all my whole life, selling medical devices. Uh, artificial prosthetic hips and knees and also heart pacemakers, heart valves. Did that my whole life. So with some good companies, Avid Labs, Bristol Myers, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of different pacemaker companies, but yeah, I had a good uh, working career. And you got married and had children? Yeah, married and uh, adopted two children. Uh, you met one, uh, Christina. And Karen, so I adopted two children, and 
lived in California like for 20 years and then moved back here 17 years ago. Okay. I got a job transfer. So I've been retired about five years. Are you enjoying it? Very much. But you know, you discover very much, but uh, you discover, you know, a part of your life like the Vietnam was just only a year. But uh, you can still, you can still continue your service through, like the VFWs. Like we went to, down to read names on the wall, and it's a com camaraderie. We our poppy drive. We raised twenty two, twenty three thousand last year. I mean, people are stepping up, giving a lot of money. So that's a hundred percent. There's no overhead. We give that right to the wounded warrior. Really good causes. We investigate the charities we give to, but uh, a lot of the vets isolate themselves. They don't see a reason to. I mean, focus, or they have images or flashbacks, and you can get rid of a lot of. They help to get rid of a lot of those flashbacks and uh, war PS PTSD. I think by joining the FWs and by getting involved, and you listen to everybody else's stories, and it kind of helps with uh, getting through your own little stories, uh, your own little. Yeah, you mentioned you joined the VFWs a few a few years ago, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Finally. Do you think you had just been kind of avoiding it for that? Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of people isolate themselves and they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to investigate. I think finding my platoon members in the last 10 years and talking to them and then actively seeking out my fitness reports and decorations and, you know, you can, it actually makes you feel better. I mean, what well, decorations did you receive? Huh? Oh, uh, combat action ribbon is my highest. Not, not many, you know, but the, the, they say, they call it the normal combat action ribbon and uh, Navy commendation, unit commendation, uh, national defense, uh, Vietnam campaign medal with four campaign stars. But none of the big ones. I got put up with the big ones, but I never got them. You know, who knows why, you know. I had a staff sergeant so my platoon. Sorry, they put me up for a big one. My uh, last CO... Captain Hill and the uh, uh, Second Battalion, Fourth Marines. I only know over two weeks what he put me up for. Uh, two bronze stars, but I never got them. And who knows, you know, why you never get them? It's just he himself. A month later, was at Russell. Right. I think he got wounded at Russell. What were the episodes of the, the bronze stars? What was? Well, I was in my ambush on the Vietnam Vietnamese. I mean, the NDA. Yeah. I think he thought that was a good thing. The way you handled it? Yeah, yeah. And the second one? Well, I think he was giving me I think he was giving me two for the same thing. Well, actually, one might have been, uh, we were on a platoon-sized ambush. We were getting heavy fire. It was cutting down the trees behind us. So we just all, I put them on line, you know, we just laying into the ground, the jungle. Was, and it was, I remember I was losing my fingernails trying to dig a bigger hole for my head. You got the helmet on, but you can feel a bullet coming through there, you know. I mean, AK-47 is a 7.62. That's like a 308 round. And, it's a big round, yeah. Yeah, it's a big guy because that's what I use for deer hunting. So I, I know the entry one, I know the exit ones. But uh, I just remember laying there and uh, trying to scratch a little more dirt away so I could fit my head lower. But it went on for like 15 minutes. I mean, it was heavy, heavy fire. And just cutting down trees and branches behind us. So it turned out uh, after about two hours, it got cleared up. It was a, a friendly Arvin unit off in the distance. They were shouldn't have been in our TAOR yeah. area responsibility, but they were there and uh, had us pinned down. So I think getting out of keeping a level head, keep it on a, I mean. Uh, resolving that mess. It turned out to be friendly fire, yeah. And you, you don't find those things out till a month later. Right. You always think it's somebody coming for you. Yeah. Or some other situation, so. Let me, let me ask you another question. You know, based on your, you know, your, your experience, you know, Vietnam combat, yeah. is there anything that, you know, future generations should learn from that? What would you tell people that are researching Vietnam years from now? Well, you got to go, you know, yeah, looking back, some of the wars today, 
looking back at Vietnam, I, I, there's a huge amount of patriotism in all of us. And if the commander in chief says they go to war, you know, the pretty smart people decide before they commit. Uh, they will in the future, American blood and treasure. Because this Afghanistan thing, I mean, he's working on or the Iraqi thing didn't work out too well. Vietnam didn't work out too well. I mean, the South Vietnamese were slaughtered in 1975 mm -hmm. after we left. That was terrible. So in the future, you know, you, you know, everybody's got a level of patriotism. And then the World War II guys, I think, were really lucky because we were fighting for our existence. And... Uh, these regional wars, uh, nation building stuff or something, uh, boy, to, to get, I would have a hard problem today getting fired up myself to fight in those wars. And we're doing the same thing in Afghanistan. We're turning it over to the right. Afghani army and half of them are Taliban, I think. And uh, it just doesn't, to lose your life over this kind of stuff, it doesn't make sense. Unless there's a clear objective. You know, and then the American, I mean, the, the young of our nation can rise up and get a little patriotism and, instead of draft, being forced to, uh, through the draft, and they'll step up and enlist like I did. Right. Well, is, uh, is there anything else you want to, you know, say or? No, but I think in regard to PTSD, I think a lot of those people, I have read recently, and it coincides with my experience, I've read that uh, a lot of people now coming back after their tours are being, uh, are being put, are being, uh, I don't know, I guess the tradition today is to leave them with the units for a couple of weeks or leave them with veterans coming back for a couple of weeks yeah. for post-deployment. And they uh, can talk about their experiences. I mean, like coming back to Vietnam, I mean, you're just in shock. I mean, you didn't get any post deployment, and then you come back and you got the American public. The reception that we did was terrible. But today they're doing the right thing. I mean, yeah, put them with the vets or maybe uh, insist that they, that they um, you know, seek out their. Uh, buddies, you know, help them with getting addresses and duty rosters and things like that so they can communicate. And because talking to each other really helps. As, as I learned from getting into a VFW post, so they should really insist that uh, they join a VFW post for a couple of years after they uh, redeploy, I mean, after they come back from a war and uh, talk to all the, like, we have 200 vets mm -hmm. from all different wars. And you can sit at a table like we do of 10 people. The guy's talking about World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, and other wars. And everybody's in the same boat and they're talking about their experiences. So you don't feel like you've had something extraordinary. I mean, everybody's... So I think it helps. I think it would help with flashbacks and PTSD and images. Uh, I mean, horrible images. But it all helps, you know, to... Uh, so I think to get proactive and insist that they join a VFW right away or post deployment, they get together with uh, some vets for a couple of weeks and have a few drinks and talk about their experience and get it get it out. Because I, I like most guys, if you talk to them, they they were never debriefed on anything. I mean, I was never debriefed on anything. I mean, somebody never said, "Well, what would you do over there?" Yeah, I mean, nobody will ever ask you that question. You know? They'll just say, well, you don't want to, they don't want to ask, or you know, they're not interested anyways. So it ends up, I mean, like the COs, like I had five COs in infantry. None of them ever debriefed me. I'd say, well, how the hell did you do that ambush, or, or how did you, how did you screw that one up, or how did you do that? You know, it turned out to be a good ambush. Uh, or tanks, you know, recovering bodies and help, uh, you know, going out and helping the reaction force, uh, helping uh, squads that were ambushed or lost in post that night. They were ambushed. Uh, you know, how did you do that successfully? You know, and what tactics did you use? I mean, that all helps uh, 
all that discussion really would would help. But we never got. I never. I never got to the, tell anybody. Uh, like my CEOs. I mean, you never really talk to them. I mean, for two 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 weeks or three weeks, and you're on the field all the time, so you never really get maybe initially one on one or five minutes. But after that, you know, it's all fun. Here's the tech checkpoints for tomorrow. Go get them. Uh, so, so, uh, you know, it was, uh, it really sounds like a lot, a lot more communication would be helpful. Yes. Oh, yeah. And just the opportunity to get debriefed. I mean, let somebody like they're doing today is great. I mean, let them hang out with vets for a couple of weeks. Insist that they do, require that they do hang out with vets through a VFW or at the expense of the U.S. government uh, when you get back, I guess. Before you uh, before you leave the military, you got to spend two weeks with some other returning vets and all talk for. Even if you don't think you have PTSD, right. or it's just it's just good to get it all out. At least talk about it once. Uh, well, I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And what I find interesting about this process is that um, the feelings you know, that vets have at the conclusion of something like this is concern about the next people that are going to experience things like this. Yes. So it's, it's, uh, I find that fascinating yeah. and I think in a way very reassuring because I yeah. think that's a very human, a wonderful human trait. Yeah. You know, is to worry about what happens. I had a horrible experience. Yeah. How can it be better for somebody else? Yeah. And I think that's through being debriefed, more of that going on, uh, of the chain of command, you know. Yeah, Even me, the battalion commander, or assistant battalion commanders, uh, lieutenant colonels, battalion commanders, assistant battalion commanders. I mean, at the end of your tour or something, at least get to meet them, you know. Yeah. Say, hey, you know, uh, what do you, uh, how do you think I did? Or, But none of that goes on. Yeah. And it... Yeah, because in your professional world, if you're not doing well, you certainly hear about it, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Get to meet them or get to be debriefed on something. If you if you did something right, uh, you know, tell the person uh, that they did something right or did well. Right. I mean, I got a plaque. It says 3rd Marine Division, 1968-69. Uh, very well done. And well, that was something, I mean... But uh, you didn't get to talk to anybody, no senior commanders, or I mean, I would have loved to been able to talk to my last CO in the infantry, or my last. Well, I only had one CO in the tanks, Kevin Miller, JJ Miller. I heard he went into the FBI, but I'd like to have had a departing conversation with him. You know, how how did I do? Did I do okay? You know. What would you have told him, Mike? What Mike? would you have told him? Well, I don't know. I hit so many mines by platoon that you were embarrassed half the time because you couldn't complete some missions, you know, that were important. I mean, people getting ambushed. You couldn't get to them because you're hitting mines. What would I have told them? Uh, I wouldn't have said anything, I guess, but I would have expected to hear something for him. He was, he's the commanding officer. Right. Like skills, you know, you you did well, you know, and or, or you, you know, you did, you did average or you did a little above average or or, you know, I really appreciated uh, your service over here. Um, that would have been nice. How do you think you did? Well, you know, c combat, you know. I mean, some, some instances you think you did poorly. Yeah. But, I mean, on my fitness reports, I've got about eight of them. I mean, they all say I did well. And they say on the fitness report, particularly desire to have. I got mostly that, so... I mean that so that meant something to me. That's that's better and and then for my platoon members, uh that's that's another thing is being proactive and seeking out, you know, like my platoon members. I mean I got some emails like you're an excellent platoon commander. Uh you're the only person I ever had respect for. Um it was an honor to serve under your command. And I, yeah. Yeah, I don't think you can do better than no. that. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for your service. 
thank you for taking the time to do this. This is, you know, this is important stuff, and yeah, I, I really, really appreciate yeah. it. Well, it's going to help other people. It's do yeah. well. Yeah. Any decorations? Are you?